let everybody get seated for a minute. And um, I don't know, I, just, I, I have, I got like three different messages to preach, but for some reason, I really feel God's bringing me back to Genesis 35. The message I preached this morning was just weird. Amen. And, um, Brian, after Brian sung that song, revive us again. And I think a lot of people don't know what revival really is. And when I say a lot of people, I mean pertaining to God's people. They don't understand the real nature of revival. And we talk about revival and things that have happened right here in our country. <coughs> there were five great revivals that took place in New England, in our country, right here in New England. And these five great revivals, they brought great transformation to our state, Massachusetts, right here. And Jonathan Edwards, he preached one of the greatest revivals. He preached sinners in the hands of an angry God. And he preached that right downtown in the Boston Commons. And hundreds and hundreds of people were falling on their knees, crying and weeping before God. Hundreds and hundreds of people were broken and weeping and crying before God. And some of us have never read about the great revivals, and we don't even know what revival is. We don't even really understand what the word necessarily means, revival. We hear about it, and we talk about it as though it was something in the past. And so it might have been something that really never even really existed. And so we, we can read about it in the Bible. We can read about great revivals in history. How many guys have read about the revivals in history? Has anyone ever read those? Yes. Basically nobody, yeah, only a couple people. I know Amy probably has her boys reading it, studying it, the great revivals. And they were preached by D.L. Moody, Charles Spurgeon, uh, Jonathan Wesley, his brother, the Wesley brothers, they were circuit rider preachers. These men would preach, they would start up here in Maine and they would preach and they would drive all the way down to, um, to, to Florida and through the coast and they would preach and they would preach these great revivals. And in these revivals that these individuals would preach, thousands of people would come to know Jesus Christ and they would be born again. They would be saved. And we live in a society today, and when you think about it, in Massachusetts, we, we don't even understand what revival is. Even the average Christian knows nothing of the idea of what revival really is. And we can go through life and kind of just go through our Christian life and never really be touched by the Holy Spirit of God never really had any, having had an encounter with God himself. And revival is, it's the initiation of God. It's when God does something in you as an individual. It's when the Holy Spirit of God does something supernatural in you, reveals himself to you, and then from that point on, you have a response to God. See, God wants to bring revival in your life personally. God wants to bring revival collectively. But the problem is, is that people do not respond to the word of God and they don't respond to the will of God. You see, revival is initiated by God, but you have an obligation to respond to what God's going to do. God will not bring revival if you do not uh, if you don't respond to his initiative work in your life. Revival is a process of the movement of the Holy Spirit of God that does something supernatural and powerful in your life where God reveals himself to you and you have an encounter with God and you are revived. The word revived, it means to be quickened, it means to become alive, it means to be aroused or stimulated. It's where God does something supernatural in you, where your life is no longer the same, and you are literally a transformed creature in Christ. Listen, the day you got saved, that was a beautiful day. Hopefully you truly got born again by the Spirit of God, where the Spirit of God came upon you and transformed you, and you met Jesus Christ, and you were changed from that point on. The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, and old things have passed away, and behold, all things are made new. Thank you, Jesus. That's the day when you met Jesus Christ. But even from that point, God wants to bring future and further revival inside of your life. God is trying to move in the spirit of God, but man does not respond to the call or to the answer of God. 
That is the problem. We have people that come to church week after week, and they'll leave the same the way they came in. They won't be transformed. They won't be changed. They'll still be dead. There'll be no there'll be no enthusiasm in their life about the things of God, about the people of God, about the singing of God. There'll be no excitement. They'll still be murmuring. They'll still be backbiting. They'll still be complaining. They'll still be sowing discord. They'll still go in the direction that they were going in with a discontent spirit, with a bitter attitude and a bitter spirit. Spirit, and they will continue to go in that direction and they will not experience God in their life. They'll never experience God. And that's a problem because you have people that hopefully they've truly been born again by the Spirit of God, but they've never been transformed and they've never experienced God in such a unique way where everything in their life is radically, radically transformed. If you would open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 35, we have what is called the nature of revival. The nature of revival. In the Bible, there are seven distinct revivals. In our country, there were five distinct revivals. It was called the Great Awakening. And in this Great Awakening, people were getting saved and, and Christians were being literally transformed. Barrooms were closing down. People, missionaries were being sent out from Harvard and Yale. And our country, right here in New England, people were being radically transformed. I think it was a, a, a it wasn't a liberal country back then. Amen. Okay, right now, yeah. bar rooms were closing down. The prohibition and all those things happen. People don't even realize. You guys had B Billy Sunday who used to play baseball, and for the White Sox, he got born again. He stopped playing baseball. He gave up his money. He gave up his career. Why? Because he wanted to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. That became more important to him than playing baseball in his own fame and his own glory. Billy Sunday would get up here, he'd think I'm a hot preacher, he'd take this pulpit, he'd flip it over, he'd smash it, he'd stop pulling things down. He was a radical, radical preacher to get people's attention, and people were getting born again and getting saved by the Spirit of God, and people fell under what is called conviction. We don't even know what conviction is any longer. Amen. Our country has become so desensitized that we don't even know what conviction is. Amen. Don't even know what it is. People literally don't even know what conviction is. If I were to ask some Christians, get up here and define conviction, they will not give you a biblical exposition of what conviction is. Because they don't even know what it is. Maybe because they've never met God. Hey, you can come to church. It don't mean you met God. Mm -hmm. yeah. you, can, you can do your little things and don't mean that you had an encounter with who God is. See, that's the problem. We come to church as though it's just a casual place to meet, and we come, sometimes we come out of a sense of obligation, we come out of a sense of duty. And there's no enthusiasm and excitement there. Why? It's because we haven't necessarily met with God. Those hymn books that you see there, there was over 6,000 hymns that were written in this time frame. The Great Awakening people truly understood what revival was because they met God and then God did something supernatural. So here we have this story over here, Genesis chapter 35. For those of you who aren't familiar with the rest of the story, I'll, I'll kind of back it up a little bit. Gen in Genesis, we see Jacob in this individual, he's basically a snake in the grass. Mm -hmm. He's always cheating somebody. He cheated his brother out of his birthright. He lied to his father. He deceived his father. And then he gets married and he deceives his father-in-law. He basically robs his father-in-law and his brother-in-law. He steals from them. Basically, that's what he did. He's an individual who's a conniver. His name, Jacob, it means deceiver, manipulator, supplanter. That's his name. Imagine naming your kid that. That's not a good name, right? You see some people, oh, my son's name is Jacob. He's got a Bible name. Oh, well, that shouldn't have been the name you gave. You should have gave him the name. Did God change his name into what? Israel. Israel. That would have been a whole lot of better name than naming him Jacob. So he's named Jacob. Deceiver, manipulator, conniver. And from his whole life, he's living a life of deception. Now, we talked about this. Jacob was at a point in his life where he had left his father-in-law after he robbed him blind. Now, he sees his brother is coming to him after he stole the birthright from his brother. So Jacob is in a pickle. 
He can't go back to his father-in-law because he just robbed him and he robbed his brother-in-law. Now he thinks his brother's going to kill him and he's overwhelmed. And God comes to him and God appears to him. Now Jacob sees things then what they really, they're not as bad as they really are. We talked about that last week. So then Jacob tells his brother, I'm going to go meet you over there in the land of Canaan. We're going to meet up later. But he doesn't do that. He stays in this place called Shechem, where he wasn't supposed to stay. He was supposed to be moving forward and doing what God called him to do. He decides to stay in this place called Shechem, right? And what he did, he exposed his family, he exposed his children, he exposed his family to these unclean Shechemites, these unclean people, and it literally cost him the defilement of his daughter. His daughter gets raped by these unclean people. You know whose responsibility that was? Mm -hmm. It was Jacob's responsibility. He should have been sheltering and protecting his family and taking his daughter to the very place where God wanted him to be. But he's like, oh no, we'll just stay here, guys. No big deal. And what it even says that he, he was facing that wicked city. He exposed his daughter. He exposed his family. He exposed his loved ones to an evil, immoral place. And it cost him. Cost him. Your parents better wake up. Amen. Once again, people are so desensitized, we don't even know what's going on around us. His daughter gets defiled. She literally is raped. Devastating story in Genesis chapter 34. Devastating story. Then we know the rest of the story. Jacob's uh, two sons, they were so mad that they, they did this. What was the sons? Levi and what was the other one? Simeon, Levi and Simeon. So they decide, oh, he's going to rape our sister. We're going to kill everyone. After you guys get circumcised, then we can give ourselves in marriages. So the men of the city, they decide, we'll get circumcised. So they get circumcised, and while they can't fight and they're sore, those two brothers go in there, and they just kill every man in the city. Not only do they kill every man in the city, but then they take all of their livestock as well. Now, the unique thing about Jacob is that God's hand, sorry, the unique thing about Jacob is that God's hand is still upon him. Now, let's look at this story here. Let's see what happens because let's talk about this nature of revival and see what revival really is. Most Christians, like I just said, most, most of you have never experienced it. You don't even know what revival is. You've never read about it. You don't know what had happened in history. But in the Bible, there are seven distinct revivals. This is one of the first ones. Okay? So let's look at the nature of what happens here in the life of Jacob. Notice the initiation. And look at it says, And God said unto Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel. Notice this. Revival is initiated by God. Does everyone understand that? That's when the Holy Spirit of God moves inside of somebody's life. It's so when the Holy Spirit of God moves in a country or a continent, whatever it means, whatever it may be. But it's when the Spirit of God moves and then the people of God respond. Does everyone understand that? Now, guys, let me explain it to you like this. When the word of God is being preached, okay, God is speaking to you. He's trying to reveal himself to you. He's trying to anoint you. He's trying to help you to know and to see who he really is. God is doing something. When the word of God is being preached, when you open up your Bible, God is trying to revive you. He's trying to revive you from being dead. He's trying to revive you from being critical and negative. He's trying to revive that, that spirit of murmur and gossiping. He's trying to revive that negative spirit inside of you. God is trying to revive you out of that negativity, out of that despair, out of that depression, out of that discouragement. God wants to revive you. He wants to literally change what's inside of you. Amen. He initiates it. But you have to respond. You have to respond to what God does. You have to respond to the will of God. You have to respond to the word of God. And you have to respond to the work of God. It's your responsibility. Now, the unique thing about revival, it brings the blessings of God. Let's, we'll get to that a little bit later. But look at this. So, and God said unto Jacob, rise up. And look, he tells him, go up to where? What does Bethel mean, people? It means the house of God, does it not? He says, you get up and you go to Bethel. Because Jacob, while you were down there in Shechem, you were on a downhill slope. You were going away from God. You were going away from his presence. Now you need to get back to Bethel, the very house of God, the church of God, where God can do something in your life. 
One of the worst things you can do is to be on that downhill slope. How many Christians have ever been there? Everyone has been there at one point or another. You're on that downhill slope, and God says, you've got to rise up and get back to Bethel, the house of God, and it's the very place where you met God before. Bethel is a place where you've experienced who God is in your life. Now, here's the problem. Stay with me, Christians. A lot of Christians have never had what we call a Bethel experience. They cannot go back in a time in their life and say, hey, that's where I met God. And if you don't have that Bethel experience, the question is, have you ever really met God? Is there a time in your life, a point in your life, when it was just you and God, and the Spirit of God came upon you, and you were broken, and you were transformed, and you understood who God was, and you were literally shivering and shaking with the fear of God, and you came to an understanding of God was. Now, if that has happened, revival is you have to go back. The Bible says, remember from whence thou art what? Fallen and repent and do what? The first work. Doesn't the Bible say that in Revelation? Okay, remember from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first work. So you have to go back to that place where you met God. You have to go back to the place where the Spirit of God came upon you and transformed you. That is your Bethel experience. When God did something supernatural inside of your life and you were no longer the same. You went from being literally a Jacob and being a Jacob, a deceiver, a manipulator, a supplanter, and God transformed you into an Israel. Amen. Prince with God, prince Amen. with people. And God said unto Jacob, rise up. So it's an upward experience, okay? We see this. We understand this, right? That's why we even sing those songs, I'm pressing on to higher ground. Look at this, right? Bethel, and dwell there, and make there an altar unto God that appeared unto thee when thou fledst from the, the face of Esau, thy brother. See, God appeared to him at that place of Bethel. He has to go back to this point in his life where he met God. Do you have that point in your life, guys? Do you have a place where you know you met God and God revealed himself to you? If you don't have that place, You've never met God. You've never met who he is. You should have that place where you can go back and you have that Bethel experience, the house of God. And what? You became the very temple of the Holy Spirit of God. Christ in you. What? Know you not that your body is the what? The temples. The house. The holy place of God. Now watch what happens in verse 2. This is the nature of revival, people. Stay with me. All right? So Jacob, he's getting, we got to get back to Bethel. We got to go forward. This is where we got to go. Now watch this, right? <clears throat> then Jacob said unto his household, and to all that were with him, say it out loud, everyone. What? Put away. The first thing you got to do if you're going to get back to Bethel, and if you're going to get right with God, the first thing you got to do is get put away the strange gods. You guys heard me say this before and before and before. In our country, we said, Pastor Mike, we don't worship strange gods. Yes, we do. Whatever you put in front of God is your strange God. How about yourself? Yourself? Your jobs? Your careers? Your money? How about your ideas? Your ideas, your thoughts? Those are all strange gods. Our worldly possessions, our worldly things. You and I are told, love not the world. Say it out loud. Neither what? The things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him for all that is in the world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. They had to put away the strange gods that were among them and be clean and change your garments. See, they couldn't go to Bethel with their idolatries and their images. See, you will only experience God when you're willing to put certain things away. See, guys, listen to me. This is why a lot of Christians will never experience who God really is. It's because they're not willing to let go. If you're not willing to let go of things and idols in your life, 
you will never, never experience the glory and the power of God in your life. You'll never experience who he is. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, you can come to church once in a blue moon. Mm -hmm. Big deal. Mm -hmm. God wants you to experience who he is. God wants you to feel his glory. God wants to anoint you with his power, his presence, his, his anointing in your life. Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and ye shall be what? Witnesses. God wants you to be able to witness under the anointing of the Spirit of God. That's right. God wants to give you his power. But he's not going to do it if you're not if you're going to continue to hold on to the idols. No man can serve what? Two masters. He's either going to love one and hate the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Amen. The very things that keep us from experiencing true revival are our worldly possessions and our worldly things and our worldly ideas. Those are the things that keep us from experiencing who God really is. They keep us from going to the place called Bethel. And Jacob said unto his household, and to all that were with him, put away thy strange gods and that are among you. And look at each other. And be clean. They had to cleanse himself. What cleanses us? What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood. And look at this. And change your garments. They had to put on a change of garments. Do you ever think about that in the Bible? I don't need to get into this whole thing on how you dress, but let me tell you something. When God gets a hold of you, you're going to dress a little bit different. Amen. Amen. You're going to think a little bit different. You're going to feel a little bit different. Amen. You are going to be a new creature in Christ. Amen. Amen. When you get to that place and you're on your way up, going back to Bethel, there is a transformation that is happening inside of you, and that transformation can be seen. It's something that can be tangible. People will look and say, hey, if any man love God, the same as what? There's no love him. They'll be able to point it out and say, man, my dad loves God. My mom loves God. Amen. My son or daughter, they love God. Amen. There'll be a transformation. Now watch what happens here. Look at verse 3, right? Jacob says once again, look at what he says in verse 3. And let us arise, look at this, and go what? And go up to Bethel, because Bethel is on an incline. Does everyone understand that? The place where he was was in Shechem. It was down low. It was in the place where God had not wanted him to be. Now he has to make this process. He has to make this journey going upward. Listen, when God gets a hold of you, you start that upward journey. You start to press forward to the mark of the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. And you know what you do? You set your affection on things that what? Are above and not on the things that are what? On this earth. Amen. Amen. That's what it means when you're climbing towards Bethel. Amen. You look at this world and you just be like... Like Solomon. Oh, it's all vanity and vexation of spirit. Amen. You look at your house, your toys, your cars, and you just look at that. Yep. And God shows you it's just fruitile, and you see the emptiness in it. Amen. And you don't want anything to do with it. Amen. Because you're on your way to Bethel. You're on your way <laughs> to the top to be with God and to meet who God is and to experience a fresh anointing in your life. Amen. The funny thing is, is Jacob tells his family, put away those idols, put away those gods. You want to know why a lot of people will never experience God? It's because they won't put away their idols and their false gods. They'll never experience revival. They'll never experience the anointing and the power of God. They'll never win souls. Those of you who never won souls, you'll never see souls being saved in your life until you put away the strange gods and you have the revival and the anointing of God. Mm -hmm. You've got a lot of Christians. Pastor Mike, I witness all the time. Yeah, you witness all the time in the flesh. Yeah. Yeah. That's why you never got one soul saved in your entire life. Because you're still down in Shechem trying to deal with those unclean Shechemites and you don't have the anointing and the power of God in your life. Listen, God was with Jacob, but he didn't have the power at this point in his life. We're going to see that in just a minute. He says, well, let us rise up and go to Bethel and I will make their altar unto God. He says, I'm, we're going to go to Bethel. And what's the first thing he's going to do? He's going to make a what, people? He's going to make an altar, a place of worship and a place of sacrifice. Listen, that's where he met God. That's where he worshiped God was in Bethel. You know what worship, worshiping God is? It's sacrifice. See, the only way you're going to experience God is through what? It's through sacrifice. 
That's how we experience his blessings, his power, his anointing, his will. That's where God gives us direction and understanding and comprehension. That's where we meet God is at the place called what? The altar. You know why we have this altar and people will come down week after week? Because they want to experience God one more time. They want to experience God and his blessings. You get some Christians, they've been coming to this church for years and years, and they've never once came down to this old altar. Because they've never once experienced him out there. Because they don't have a place called Bethel. See, God wants to know you, and he wants you to know him. He wants to experience you as you will experience him. Now look what happens here, verse 4, right? Look what happens in verse 4. Back up to verse 3 so you can see the dialogue. Look at this, verse 3 again. And let us arise and go to Jacob. says, let us arise and go to Bethel. And I will make, the, I will make there an altar unto God. He says, this is what we're going to do. So Jacob is responding to the initiation work of the Holy Spirit of God. He says, God called him, and what did he do? He responds. Okay? Now watch this. All right. Who answered me in the way... Look at this, of my distress. And when, look at this, and was with me in the way which I went. Now Jacob identifies that God was with him even in the backslidden state of his life. Even when he was living a life of deception and evil, Jacob is still experiencing God's grace and his mercy. Aren't you glad that? Aren't you glad that the Bible says God's mercies are renewed, what? Morning by morning and day unto day. Aren't you glad that you can get a fresh a renewing with God every day and every morning? That you can wake up and you can have a re-anointing of the Spirit and you can have a re-anointing of revival in your life. Moment by moment and day by day. But some of us Christians won't let go of our idols. We won't let go of our images. We won't let go of the things that consume us, that compel us, that that motivate us, that stir us, and arouse us. Therefore, we will never have a point of Bethel. Right. Amen. That's what happens to a lot of Christians. It's so sad. Mm -hmm. you're, like, you, you're trying to bring them to the place where they can meet God and they can understand his mercy and they can understand his anointing in their life, but they'll never understand it. And you try to explain these things to some Christians and they don't even know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. yeah. Literally. It's like talking Chinese to them. It's almost like talking to a lost man who's never been born again. You try to explain certain things to them. They don't know what you're talking about. You try to talk to them about a burden. You try to talk to them about anointing. They have no understanding what you're even saying. Unless you've experienced those things. Then you can understand. The Bible says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen. I'm trying to get you to taste something, guys. Taste something that you've never tasted until you've tasted it. And once you've tasted it, everything else will be bitter. That's right. Yep. Nothing in this world will ever satisfy you ever again. See, they had to let go of their images and their idols and their strange things if they were ever going to experience God. Look at verse 4. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods. Look at this. Which were in their hands. You see that? You can't serve God and what? And man, they had to be willing. Hey, God, here, here, Jacob, here you go. And they're throwing their gods down. Don't you love that? They got rid of them. You know, most of us that if God showed us that certain things were gods in our lives, we wouldn't get rid of it. Seriously. You know it. If God told you, hey, sell that house, sell your cars, sell everything, I'm calling you to do something for me. You'd be like this. Can't hear you, God. You wouldn't even want to hear that. And then here's what happens. This is the, the paradoxical situation. You go back to your strange gods and your strange things, right? You're angry. You're discontent. You're frustrated. You're discouraged. You're anxious. You're worried. God says that's the way you want to live. Jesus says, if you come to me, you can get rid of all that. And I'm going to give you the peace of God that passes all understanding. I don't care if you, even if you don't have a house. I'll give you peace that you never experienced. I don't care if you don't have a place to live. I'll give you, I'll give you the grace and the peace that passes all understanding where my spirit and your spirit will be unified together as one. And you won't be worried about a thing. You won't have the same fears and turmoils and stress and worries. But some of you like to live like that. So look what they did. 
And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in the hand. Now look at this. And all the earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the oak which was by Shechem. Notice what he does. He goes up there. He buries these things under the tree. He's like, we ain't taking this stuff with us. Mm -hmm. See, this stuff cannot get with me, guys. It cannot go to Bethel. Okay? Does everyone see that? Mm -hmm. Where did he leave it? He left it in the place where his daughter was defiled. He left it in the very place where he had to come out of. He left it in the place where he ought not to have been. He says, listen, these things can't come with us. We're going to leave these things here because we need to move forward. And we cannot bring those things to worship God. And we cannot bring those things to Bethel. Listen, guys, you will never experience Bethel until you leave or be willing to leave things behind. You'll never experience who God is. Guys, some of us, like, we think that these possessions and these worldly things are going to satisfy you. Let me tell you something. It's not going to bring any happiness, any joy, any fulfillment, or any satisfaction in your life. And if it is, you've never experienced God. You've never experienced Bethel. Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived. He had possessions, everything. Everything he had, like worldly things, everything. He said, whatever my eyes see, I withheld not from it. He looked at everything when he experienced God. He said it was all vanity and vexation of spirit. It meant nothing to him. The Apostle Paul, a man who owned nothing, possessed nothing, and had nothing, was a man that lived a life of, of joy, happiness, and prosperity, inward prosperity. He understood because he, under, he experienced revival on a regular basis. Even though he was being whipped, tortured, and in prison, he still had a life of peace and joy and contentment. <clears throat> Because he was experiencing God in his life. Verse 4 again. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand. Look at this. And the earrings which were in their ears. And what did he do? He takes them and he hides them. He puts them there. He buries them there. They're left behind. Now watch. In ver and it goes on which were by Shechem in verse 5. And they journey. See now they can make the journey to the place of Bethel, where the God, God is going to have that revival for them, okay? But notice the nature of what is taking place here, okay? They weren't going to make the journey until they let go of what? Idols. The idols and the gods. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be honest. Most, most of God's people don't even know what an idol is, but yet they worship it mm -hmm. on a daily basis. An idol is something that takes more of your devotion, more of your time, more of your money, more of your energy. That is your idol. Let me give you an example. Where does most of your money go right now? We're not asking this is facetiously speaking ahead. Where most of your money goes, that is your idol right now. You've got some of God's people that don't even tithe. They wouldn't even think of tithing. Because God is not their what? Idol or their God. You see how that thing works, guys? Yeah. Guys, we put everything in our life in front of God, including me, myself, and I. That's why a lot of God's people will never experience who God is. They gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand and the areas. And then what? And then they journeyed. Then they journeyed. They made the journey after they got rid of the strange gods. Now they can move forward. Now they can progress into this area and into this place where God called them to be because they put away the strange gods. See, that's the beginning of the journey for you and I. If we're going to ever experience revival and if we're ever going to get to the place called Bethel, we've got to be willing to put away those idols in our lives. Or you'll never experience Bethel. No. And it's sad because most Christians have never experienced God in their life. They've never gotten along with God, right? And read the Bible. And then God starts to speak to them. 
and then they're, they're like trembling. And you're reading that Bible and you're going, whoa. And the fear of God comes upon you and the Holy Spirit has anointed you and you're seeing things in such a clear way in your own life, in the world, where you just, you're just blown away by it. And all you want is more of who God really is. And then all that thrills your soul is Jesus. Now watch what happens in verse 5, because let's talk about this, right? We see him, Jacob, this is the process in the nature of revival. Now look at verse 5, right? And they journey. They make the journey now. They're leaving Shechem, the place of defilement, the place of corruption. They're leaving the world, and they're on their way to meet God back in Bethel. And look what happens. And the terror of God was upon the cities which were around about them. And notice it's a capital G. It's the terror of God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. The Bible says, we therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord, what do we do? We persuade men. Guys, if you've never experienced the terror of God, you've never been born again. The terror of God is when you determine and you see yourself as a sinner and you realize who and what you are before a holy and a righteous and a just God and you realize that your God is a consuming fire and that he can destroy you on, on the, just by a breath. Amen. You're overwhelmed with fear. The terror of God comes upon you. You're literally shaking and you're crying presumably. You're just weeping. Because you know that the judgment of God is going to come upon you. Amen. And then you fled to Jesus Christ, our refuge. Amen. You say, Pastor Mike, I never felt that way. You've never experienced God. I never felt terrified. You've never experienced God, guys. You've never experienced who he is. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, Isaiah also it says, and there is no fear of God before their eyes. The problem is, is we live in a society today where people are not taught to fear God any longer, where preachers do not preach the fear of God. Let me tell you something, the Bible says our God is a consuming fire. Jesus Christ himself says, don't fear them which can destroy the body, but rather fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Amen. Jesus said that. Don't fear the people that can destroy your body. But let me tell you something. You fear him, God, who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Mm -hmm. here's, the, here's how this thing works. If you know who God is, and you, he's, he's revealed himself to you. You're afraid of him because you don't understand who he is. Mm -hmm. But here's what happens. People who claim to, oh, I believe in Jesus, I'm a Christian, I believe in God. Do you fear him? Oh, absolutely not. I don't fear God. <laughs> you see how it contradicts? Mm -hmm. The fear of God is the beginning of what? Wisdom. Wisdom. And to depart from evil is what? Understanding. It's understanding. <clears throat> there's, there's, look at me. What's happening in this revival in Jacob's life is bringing a terror of God around those cities. It's bringing the fear of God around those cities which were around about them. And they did not even pursue the sons of Jacob. They didn't even go after them. Now watch what happened to you. Look at verse 6. So, so, so Jacob came to Luz, which is in the land of Canaan. That is Bethel. He's finding it. He's back to the place where he needs to be. He and all his people that were with him. <clears throat> now watch what happens here. It's very, very important things that we see here, right? And he built an altar. He built an altar, right? He built there an altar. And he called the place Al Bethel, which means back to the house of God, okay? Because there God appeared unto him when he fled from the face of his brother. Now watch what happens here. Just out of the blue, this is just thrown in here. But Deborah... Rebecca's nurse died. That was, now remember, that's his mother's nurse, the very one who took care of him as a baby and as a child. She died and was buried beneath Bethel under an oak. And the name was called Alon Barrett. Now watch what happens. This is very important to understand this, right? So she dies, okay? 
because Jacob is taking on a whole new form of life. So all of a sudden, this is just dropped in the text. She got God says, this old part of your life is done away with. I've got whole new adventures for you. I've got a whole new thing for you because everything that is in the past is done away with. And I'm bringing you forward to new things and to a new way of life. See, this woman represents principles. She represents a caretaker in his life. And she dies because he is no longer bound to her. He is no longer under her. And Jacob is moving forward. And he's progressing to new things in his life. Now watch what happens here again, right? Look what happens. So verse 8, we see she dies. Now look at verse 9. And God appeared unto Jacob again when he came out of Panoramum and, and, and blessed him. God said unto him, thy name, look at this, is Jacob. Thy name shall not be called any more Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name. And he named, look at this, and he called his name Israel. Now watch what's happening here, guys. God says, Jacob, you're no longer Jacob. I see you different now. You're no longer the deceiver, the manipulator. The conniver. You're no longer what you once were. Amen. Because I've changed you and I've given you a new name. Mm -hmm. God's telling him, I see you different from what you once were. Mm -hmm. I see you different from how you were living. I see you different from the things that you used to do. I see you completely different, and you and I are going into a whole new experience. Thank you. Has that ever happened in your life? Thank you. Where you see God differently? And watch this. You see yourself differently. Amen. You don't see yourself as the deceiver, the manipulator. Amen. You don't see yourself in what you used to be, the complainer, the murmurer, the, the gossiper, the backbiter. You don't see yourself, the one that was discontent and angry and frustrated. You don't see yourself in all those things, but you see yourself the way God sees you. Amen. The, have you experienced that in your life? Amen. Where the anointing of God came upon you. Look at that in verse 10. And God said unto him, thy, look at this, thy name is Jacob. Thy name shall not be called Jacob anymore, but Israel. Prince with God and prince with man. That's a good name right there. But Israel shall be thy name. And he called his name Israel. Now watch this. Because of the revival Look what the revival brings, guys. Stay with me, right? Watch this. And God said unto him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins. And the land which I, which I gave Abraham and, and Isaac to thee, I will give it. And to thy seed after thee will I give the land. And God went and God went up from him in the place where he talked with him. Now we'll get into this later on next week, but notice what happens. Because of, because of Jacob's response to the initiating call of revival, now what do we see? Now we see the blessings of God in his life. Mm -hmm. Now we see God moving in his life. God, when we respond to God's call in our life, that's when we receive the very blessings of God in our life. Respond to what God wants to do in your life. Amen. Guys, we all have to have a Bethel experience. It's an experience where you meet God in a new way. Mm -hmm. Where you experience the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom. Mm -hmm. And you are literally trembling mm -hmm. before God. Do you ever read about some of those guys who met God yeah. in the Bible? They all tremble, every one of them. They're like, it's, it's an overwhelming experience. Mm -hmm. It's a place where you come to an understanding of who you are and who God really is. Mm -hmm. And you have that Bethel experience Amen. where you meet God and God meets with you. And you are never, ever the same. Mm -hmm. Your whole train of thought is different. 
Do you remember when Jacob wrestled with God? You guys know the story. Mm -hmm. He was wrestling with God. God says, oh, you want to keep fighting with me? Okay. God goes like this. Boom. Blows his hip up. Now he's walking with a limp his whole life. God says, I will give you a reminder because you wanted to wrestle me. Mm -hmm. I'll give you a reminder that you will never forget. Listen, I'll fight anyone in this room. <laughs> but I ain't fighting God. Amen. Some of you guys, it's, it's, I'm going to say it, it's fools. You've been wrestling with God for year after year. That's why you're discontent. That's why you don't have peace. That's why you're frustrated, angry, bitter. This is why you have these mixed emotions, depression, discouragement, anxiety, worry, all of those mixed emotions. Because God fights with you in the midst of your emotions. God fights with you to get you to submit and to surrender to who he is. The greatest thing you can do is just, just submit. Submit. That's, that's the best thing you can do. Amen. Some of these guys, you know, we do a little bit of grappling. And some of these pride gets in the way and they don't want to tap. They get caught in a heel hook. They don't want to tap. Next thing you know, they're limping for days, right? Mm -hmm. right. Or they get in an arm bar. They don't want to tap. Now they're on the sore. They get caught with a choke. They don't want to tap. Next thing you know, they're like, <laughs> sleeping on the mat. And everybody's trying to wake them up. Wake up, wake up. Well, some of you, is, your pride has kept you wrestling with God. Mm -hmm. Year after year after year. Mm -hmm. That's why you're always on edge. You're always on edge. You're always on edge. You're always on edge. Stressed out about this, worried about that, frustrated, angry at this person, frustrated. Always on edge, always on edge. Discontent, fearful, confused. All those mixed emotions are the very point when God is wrestling with us to get us to submit to surrender, to cast away those images and those idols so God can revive us and quicken us and unite us and strengthen us in our inner being. Guys, Bethel is the place to be. Amen. Does everyone understand that? It's the place where God's going to bless you. It's the place where you're going to meet him. Listen, outside of Bethel, you won't have the peace, the joy, the contentment, the fulfillment. You won't have any of those things. It's only in Bethel where you will experience the grace and the love and the peace and the contentment. And you can do all things in Christ only in Bethel. Amen. Only in Bethel will you experience the blessings of God in your life. Let's move up to Bethel. I'm going to have Trish come and Brian come. I'm going to have them do, is you're all on the altar. If you've never had that Bethel experience,